Tonight, hundreds of Canadians quarantined on a cruise ship. If I do not receive food soon, I will be in a diabetic coma. Confined to their cabins for two weeks as the coronavirus spreads. Also tonight, we're in Washington for a historic moment. Donald Trump acquitted. The emotional moment, one Republican broke ranks. What the president did was wrong, grievously wrong. A commercial airliner in pieces, a fire on board, how the passengers escaped. And a warning for breast cancer patients taking vitamins. I was shocked at that. This is The National. On a cruise ship off the coast of Japan, more than 200 Canadians are under quarantine tonight, facing two weeks stuck in their rooms because there is a coronavirus outbreak on board. Two Canadians are among those infected. Tanya Fletcher spoke to a passenger from British Columbia. From the outside, you'd never guess the drama unfolding inside. Please know that we are uh, handling this uh, situation as a top priority. Nearly 4,000 passengers, but the corridors empty, the foyers deserted. The only sign of activity, health officials covered head to toe and cleaners disinfecting every corner. 20 passengers have now been infected, at least some already escorted off and taken to hospital. The cruise was supposed to end Tuesday, but instead, now another two weeks at sea. Passengers are confined to their cabins. Some have balconies, others don't even have windows. I'm calling it cabin arrest. It's a three meter by five meter room and uh, we can't leave. Paul Mirko is from Metro Vancouver and diabetic. We got a form left at our door and we're supposed to fill that out and um, uh, hopefully Ministry of Health will provide medications before everything runs out. I brought extra with me so I'm, I'm good for four or five days but uh, that's, that is a concern. Food is delivered to each room. Meals though a concern for people with dietary needs like David Abel who's also diabetic. If I do not receive food soon I will be in a diabetic coma. Staff eventually provided him what he needed, but passengers say communication has been slow. Many questions remain, like how the cruise line plans to contain any potential new cases. I can't see how they're going to be able to monitor this any other way than taking serious samples. Just temperature checks, to me, is going to be inadequate. Concerns the Canadian government is trying to address, too. Again, we want to reassure the families both on the, on the cruise ship that we are uh, alert and engaged in their issue uh, and, uh, and trying to work with families at home to reassure them as well. For those trapped on board, the uncertainty grows day by day. At the end of the 14 days, can I go home? For now, they have nothing but time to wonder and worry. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. And it isn't just one cruise ship that's quarantined its passengers. Off the coast of Hong Kong, there's another. And as Chris Brown shows us, keeping all those people on board is just one new step the territory is taking to try to lock the virus down. It was supposed to be a five-day cruise to Taiwan for these mostly Hong Kong passengers, but their stay on the world dream may stretch out now two more weeks. On the ship's previous voyage, three passengers tested positive for the coronavirus, and they may have infected the crew. We saw ambulances pull alongside the ship, and three people were taken away. Authorities say about two dozen other crew members also show potential symptoms, so they're getting checked out too. We managed to have a quick chat with passenger Rex Louie over the phone. He told us he saw some crew members coughing and taking medicine. How do you feel? I think the way Hong Kong is handling this is very good, he said. We should cooperate. And the photos he sent us showed people on board appeared to be making the best of it. This community official who's monitoring the situation says Hong Kong can't risk letting anyone off the ship. For them, at this stage, maybe they don't have any symptom, but they might have already contracted and uh, been contaminated. Shortly afterwards, Hong Kong closed the port to all traffic, with 21 confirmed coronavirus cases in the territory and the infection rate growing. Hong Kong's chief executive took a decisive step today, targeting anyone who crosses the border from mainland China. My the compulsory quarantine period will be 14 days, she said. 
What's especially concerning is that in some of the new cases, the victims had not been to mainland China, and authorities can't tell who infected them, suggesting there could be a lot of undetected cases. We can see the trend for the outbreak is worsening. On the streets, there's evidence a lot of people think so too. We drove alongside an incredible lineup of 10,000 people, blocks long, all waiting to buy scarce face masks for protection. Okay, so Chris, where are we at on the testing of those sick crew members? Well, we know overnight the uh, captain told passengers that those uh, people who were taken off did get their tests. The results should be known today, but maybe even more worrying is the fate of some of the passengers on the previous trip. 250 people were dropped off here in Hong Kong, and now health authorities are scampering around trying to find them to see if they might have symptoms. Andrew. And Chris, what about the new quarantine measures for people coming from mainland China? How will those work? It's a bit unclear how it's going to work, whether Hong Kong residents will be able to serve their quarantines in their homes or if they'll have to go to essentially converted holiday camps, which is what has been the practice so far. There's also been talk of using perhaps some of the hotels at, uh, at Disneyland for that as well, the Hong Kong Disneyland. Uh, but there's also some problems with uh, the quarantines. A lot of uh, neighbours don't want people who might be sick uh, staying near where they live. Andrew. All right. Chris Brown in Hong Kong. Now, there's also the matter of those Canadians who are still inside the infected zone on the Chinese mainland. Ottawa's plan to get them out has hit a snag. And as Ashley Burke reports, patience is starting to fray. It's a very dynamic situation. Uh, things change by the day. Dynamic is an understatement. Weather has delayed the first evacuation flight from Wuhan, where many have already started making their way to the airport, roadblock by roadblock. Wow, it's raining hard. You can see it's pretty deserted. This Ottawa family of three was stuck at the final police checkpoint for at least 13 hours. CBC's agreed to withhold their names because of their fears for their family's safety. It's uh, quite frustrating. They slept in the car Hello. and struggled to get Hello. through to Canadian officials. And it feels like the government is not on top of things and maybe that things are pretty chaotic and things are breaking down. <laughs> so we don't really know what's going on right now. And adding to the confusion, the government today also told Canadians in the rest of China to leave if they can. We are advising Canadians whose presence in China is not essential to depart via commercial means while they remain available. But that may not be easy. Commercial flights out of China are becoming harder to find after Air Canada, British Airlines and others all suspended routes from the mainland. Those kinds of things raise some concerns about the ability for Canadians to be able to return in a timely fashion. Not an option for Canadians stuck at the epicenter of the outbreak. The only way out is government airlift, but even the flights scheduled for Thursday will not be able to get all the Canadians out. It has 211 seats available, but more than 160 others want to leave. This afternoon, another option became available. We now have secured a few seats on the flights organized by the United States authorities. That U.S. plane has room for a few dozen Canadians. Ottawa has also said it has a second flight reserved if needed, but they still have to get the first flight into China and off the ground. The hope is that will happen Thursday. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, one aspect of the story that many parents and teachers across Canada are grappling with is the anxiety all this may be causing for kids. I hear a lot of adult conversations and I've kind of like researched because I, I don't know, I get pretty worried about that stuff, but when I know more about it, I don't get as worried. Talking to children about the coronavirus and seeing things through their eyes. That's later in the program. But let's head to Washington, where the Senate reached a verdict in Donald Trump's impeachment trial. Adrian. Well, that's right, not guilty, a surprise to no one, but no less momentous. The tension hours ago in this building was never over the outcome, but over how the U.S. Senate would reach it. And after days of deliberation behind me is a capital divided. So tonight in Washington, Donald Trump is acquitted. Now to some, he's a president vindicated. To others, it leaves the republic violated. Democrats accused Trump of abusing his office, of withholding political and military support from an ally at war to damage 
a rival 2020 presidential candidate. A few Republicans voiced disapproval of Trump's conduct, but Susan Ormerson shows us how, in the end, this was a partisan vote completely down party lines, with one notable exception. Is the respondent, Donald John Trump, guilty or not guilty? The outcome was not in question, but those two words, guilty or not guilty, delivered a somber verdict of their own. Mr. Booker, guilty. Mr. Senators split neatly along party lines, save for one lone voice. Mr. Romney. Guilty. Mr. Romney, guilty. Republican Mitt Romney, struggling to convict. My faith is at the heart of who I am. His decision to buck his own party, his toughest ever. In some quarters, I will be vehemently denounced. I'm sure to hear abuse from the president and his supporters. He has. Donald Trump Jr. tweeting, Romney is now part of the resistance and should be expelled. The deputy sergeant at arms will... With the months of inquiry, the hearings, and then a the trial, the Democrats chamber. forced the facts in front of Republicans, but failed to change a preordained verdict. Democrats walked out of the Senate chamber with their heads held high because we sought the truth. Democrats calculated if they didn't move to impeach Donald Trump, how could they campaign against his abuse of power? But it was always a risky strategy, and now even reluctant Republicans have closed ranks around their president. The only way this is going to end permanently is for the president to get reelected. And he will. In Iowa, where that election campaign began with a big bump this week, people are ready to move on. Like Way too long. Now. There's a lot of other problems that need to be solved. At this point, unimpressed with the impeachment finale. I think history will judge it as being a very partisan time. Um, I think that divisiveness was in a good time for us as a country. And that's something Americans can agree on. Okay, so Susan Trump didn't uh, address this today, but he has indicated that he's going to talk about the impeachment hoax uh, tomorrow. Yeah. What's the strategy there? Well, clearly, in their eyes, we won, you lost. The Democrats made a huge political miscalculation. People are tired of the endless debate over impeachment. That's their take. Now, in Iowa, where we were both mm -hmm. this week, we did hear from people about impeachment, a burning frustration with it. They wanted it done and over. But I think even Democrats are not convinced about the impact this will have in the next trial, if you will, whether he'll be rewarded right. or penalized in the 2020 election. We're well, certainly enjoying his approval ratings yeah, right now. Exactly, rising. All right, Susan, thank you very much. All right. So no matter where you stand on Donald Trump, his talent for political survival is undeniable. From the Access Hollywood tape to Stormy Daniels to Robert Mueller, he has weathered it all and more. Now he has survived impeachment. Paul Hunter takes stock of his strength with the presidential election nine months away. Safely acquitted on impeachment, it's the big question for Donald Trump. What next? His answer was to put this at the top of his Twitter feed, suggesting he's not going anywhere. Think about it. A huge platform last night. America's future is blazing bright. Today, the win on impeachment riding a bump in the polls, and the kind of campaign message that's been winning elections for decades. Under President Trump, America is stronger, safer, and more prosperous than ever before. Leaving many to wonder, will Trump now romp to a second term? I think uh, any prediction of what's going to happen in November is way premature. In the age of Trump, things change overnight. A good week could turn into a disastrous week very, very easily. Political historian Alan Lichtman has studied the lead-ups to presidential elections for years. He's devised a formula that's predicted presidential winners in every election but one since 1984, including Trump in 2016. Trump 2020, he says, still too close to call. To win, says Lichtman, at the least, Trump would have to find a way to cause no fresh trouble from now till voting day, in a sense, to do no harm. But that's not how Donald Trump operates. Donald Trump is going to be as belligerent, as aggressive, as unrepentant as he possibly can. And 
Who knows where that might lead? Then again, who knows where Democrats will go with no clear front runner emerging from Iowa and Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi signaling last night the looming battle for the White House will be a bitter one. For the moment, Trump stands in the feel-good spotlight, nine months from the vote, a lifetime these days. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. And an update on that other political drama still playing out. More results of Monday's Iowa caucuses have been released after being delayed by technical problems. Pete Buttigieg is holding his lead, and former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden is in fourth place. Today, he acknowledged that is not where he wants to be. I am not going to sugarcoat it. We took a gut punch in Iowa. The whole process took a gut punch. But look, uh, this isn't the first time in my life I've been knocked down. The Iowa caucuses are the first test for candidates in the race for the White House. New Hampshire is next on Tuesday. That is where candidates are campaigning now. And so that's it for us here in Washington tonight. We'll send it back to Andrew in Toronto. Turkish authorities are investigating a shocking incident at an Istanbul airport. Three people are dead after a crowded airliner overshot the runway and broke apart. World Report host Neil Cooksall has long covered Turkey for CBC News, and as she tells us, things could have been dramatically worse. This is the moment Pegasus Airlines Flight 2193 sped across the runway surface. Slick from the February rain, the plane propelled by the night's heavy winds. It just couldn't stop. Istanbul's governor, Ali Yerlikaya, says the plane then tumbled off the runway, sliding into a ditch 30 to 40 meters below. The Boeing 737 broke into three pieces. Those gaping holes and jagged edges remarkably became the escape route for some of the terrified passengers. Doğuş Bilgic is one of them. It was total chaos. People who were doing well helped the others a lot, he said in an interview with Turkish network NTV. Turkish officials say the plane was carrying 183 passengers and crew, including two babies. But incredibly, though most of the passengers were hurt, most of their injuries are listed as minor. Considering the circumstances, it's actually probably uh, quite remarkable the airplane wasn't in worse shape. Judson Rollins studies airline safety. In all probability, it looks like the pilots landed too fast and too far down the runway to be able to stop the airplane safely. This is the third similar and recent incident for the discount airline. Just last month, at this same airport, another Pegasus plane slid off the runway. No one was hurt. In 2018, these stunning images made headlines. A Pegasus flight nearly plunged into the waters below after sliding off the runway in the country's Black Sea city of Trabzon. No one was killed. Each incredibly close calls, full disaster averted, but this time, deadly. Turkish prosecutors say they are investigating. Neil Kuxal, CBC News, Toronto. Well, a new health warning tonight for anyone undergoing cancer treatment. Coming up on The National, why taking vitamins could be harmful. He said immediately that I had to stop taking all of them. Airbnb changes who can rent what in Canada after a deadly shooting in Toronto. The shootings, that's the tip of the iceberg. Oh, there's two right below us, straight to the right. And we're in the air as scientists race to protect Canada's moose from a deadly new threat. We're back in two minutes. Airbnb is testing out a rule change in Canada that would stop some young adults from using the site. It comes after a shooting at a Toronto condo over the weekend. Three people were killed, and it's just the latest deadly incident tied to the company's rentals. As Talia Ricci explains, the response is to cut off the supply. The building back there, one of the buildings here, and that building over there. You're almost the last standing local house here. Serena Purdy says most of her neighbors have been replaced by strangers visitors renting on Airbnb. We have 
had serious safety issues. It's not just parties, it's the lack of community. But parties were much of the focus today as Airbnb announced new measures to address safety. In the last six months alone, there have been at least five shootings at Airbnbs in the Toronto area. The latest resulted in the deaths of three young men. Nothing we're going to say or do uh, can bring back those lives, um, but we're certainly going to talk about what we believe we should do from a responsibility perspective. Starting this month, Canadians under 25 will no longer be able to rent an entire home or condo within a local area unless they have a good track record on the site. The company is also setting up a complaint line for residents. What we envision this policy accomplishing is creating uh, increased friction for people looking to make those types of reservations. The shootings, is, it, that's the tip of the iceberg. Corbin Wyditz is with Fair B&B, &B, which advocates for fair short-term rental rules. He doesn't think the changes will stop the parties. If I would be 25, I would have my friend who's 26 book the, book the place and then we would have a party. But Airbnb says the new rules are based on their own data. And if it makes rentals safer here, they'll try it in other countries too. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Now to some of the other stories we're following across the country tonight. Talks to end an ongoing standoff over a natural gas pipeline in B.C. have broken down. The province was in last-ditch talks with hereditary chiefs from the Wet'suwet'en First Nation to end their protest of the coastal gaslink pipeline in northern B.C. But the province says the two sides are not seeing eye to eye, meaning protesters need to leave or face arrest. Those that want to be arrested but will not move, we will carry them away from the area with very little force being used. Coastal Gasling says it plans to resume work on the pipeline in the coming days. Four people were arrested in Regina today outside the co-op oil refinery as tensions continued to climb between locked out workers and management. <laughs> Uniform members have barricaded the complex for more than two weeks now and both co-op and Regina police say the barricades are illegal. Meanwhile, police say they are investigating multiple reports of managers' homes being vandalized with paintballs. And much of eastern Canada bracing for another heavy hit of winter weather. A combination of snow and freezing rain is on its way to Newfoundland, where many are still recovering from last month's historic blizzard. The Maritimes have also been blanketed with a special weather statement with as much as 50 centimeters of snow expected in some areas by Friday. The same system is also hitting parts of Quebec in southern Ontario overnight, where officials are preparing for what could be a messy morning commute. The inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls wrapped up a number of months ago. Its legacy lives on, though, through a commemoration fund. And as Olivia Stevanovich tells us, today a project was revealed that victims' families hope will lead to some closure. After a four-hour drive, Johnny Wilde arrives at his destination, where his daughter is being remembered. Wilde has been searching for her for six years. You have to do something, not stay at home <clears throat> and wait and wait. You're not going to find in anything. Now, he's placing his hope on the Kitigan Zibi Anishinaabeg Tribal Council's new missing persons alert billboard. Hopefully somebody will see that and say, you know what, I'm, I know something. An image of Lori Ojik's teenage daughter is also on display. Maisie Ojik vanished in 2008. She was last seen with her friend Shannon Alexander, who is also missing. It's always a, a touch of sadness because we still don't have answers as a family as to what happened to our girls. The billboard is one of 80 commemoration projects funded through the inquiry. $13 million was set aside for artwork, educational and awareness campaigns across the country. I think that they will be uh, effective because it doesn't give us the choice to ignore this anymore. It's been eight months since the release of the inquiry's final report. Former Commissioner Kaya Robinson is still waiting for action. I think that we all have to collectively keep demanding more. An official update on the federal government's response to the inquiry is expected in June. But for the families, the answers they seek are somewhere up this highway. And this billboard may help close a painful chapter. 
Olivia Stefanovich, CBC News, Kitigan ZB, and Ishnabeg. Okay, time for a quick break. When we come back, a new warning for people undergoing cancer treatment. Why vitamin supplements could be dangerous. Plus, how did the coronavirus start? That's a really good question. Tough questions and candid conversations. How kids see the coronavirus and how to talk to them about it. That's ahead. Vitamins are big business in this country. Canadians spend about $3 billion on them every year. But for a long time, medical researchers have questioned just how useful they are in healthy people. And now, as Vic Adopi explains, a new study suggests taking supplements during cancer treatment could actually be harmful. Ingrid Fauché Murphy tries to stay as fit as possible. She was diagnosed with breast cancer seven years ago. As she waited for treatment, Murphy wanted to increase her odds. So she also went to a naturopathic doctor. And he prescribed various multitude of vitamins, which included A, B, C, D, uh, melatonin, 20 milligrams melatonin, which is um, fairly high and um, some other supplements like turmeric, uh, which is uh, antioxidant. It was not a prescription her oncologist approved of. He worried popping vitamins would interfere with chemotherapy, a critical part of cancer treatment. I thought I was pretty proud of myself that I was being very proactive in, in all of these vitamins. And he said immediately that I had to stop taking all of them. This new study supports that advice. It followed 1,100 breast cancer patients in Canada and the U.S. through treatment. 18% took vitamins like A, C, or E. Their risk of the cancer returning was 40% higher. When I started this study, uh, I really didn't think we'd see anything at all. Just as surprising well, to the lead I, author, I even non-antioxidant supplements such as vitamin B12 and iron supplements also carried a similar risk. The findings show only an association, not cause and effect, and it's a small group statistically. Still, concerns over taking vitamins during cancer treatment have been around for a while. But not all patients in the study knew that. Probably only about half the patients had a conversation with their doctor about use of supplements. Chemotherapy uses special drugs to destroy cells, both cancerous and normal cells. But antioxidants like vitamins A, C, E and coenzyme Q10 help repair cell damage and that can interfere with this process. This cancer doctor says the study deepens the understanding of the potential risks of vitamins. Patients think that it will boost their immunity when they are on chemotherapy or radiation. We believe they counter the cytotoxicity or in other words the, the benefit, the, the work, how the chemotherapy and radiation works. Vitamin supplements can play a role in recovery after cancer treatment. As for Ingrid Fauché Murphy, her treatment's long over and she's back to taking her vitamins. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. And next on The National, talking to kids about the coronavirus. What would you want to tell grown-ups about how they should be talking to kids like you? How to cut through their anxiety. Next. I know. And the race to protect Canada's moose from a tiny yet deadly threat. We are back after this. Well, it goes without saying, children see the world very differently than grown-ups. And that's especially true when it comes to the coronavirus. Because even when the risks are small, their concerns can get blown up. So, I paid a visit to a small alternative school in Toronto where teachers have drawn up a plan to tackle the subject very directly and for a very diverse spectrum of students. Here's what I saw. Has anybody else heard that term, coronavirus? What is that? It's a virus that's been going around. And why do you have to keep worrying about viruses? Why do we have to keep worrying wow. about viruses? I know. It can spread really, quick, really quickly. Yeah, the so questions here are of. honest. How did the coronavirus start? That's a really good question. Sometimes they're you awkwardly blunt. Should we eat food that comes from China? There is nothing to worry about when you're. But they're going never into brushed a aside. Festival. Like I wonder if like they run out of food and then they can't leave their house or something. Yeah, I wonder that too. And so I wonder if um, the grocery stores are still open. 
These kids are textbook examples of how rumor and half-truths can slosh around in a child's mind and come out looking pretty scary. The first time 11-year-old Samantha Shannon heard about the coronavirus? My friend came to school school, and he, he started saying, nobody touch me, nobody touch me. Why was he saying that? Because he heard about it on the news. He heard about it on the news? Yeah. And that was the first time you heard about it? Yeah. When he said, don't touch me? Yeah. And a similar startle for eight-year-old Kale. He's only in grade three, but the things his friends say they've seen on TV. Doctors had, like, this white suit, like, you know, like, to get, like, wasps. Yeah, like a full protective suit all yeah, over their bodies. Yeah, and they were fixing, like, the person. Had... And how did you feel when you saw that? I felt like it might get viral around places and it might come to new places and spread, like Quebec, Canada, New Jersey, Ottawa. All those places. It sounds like you were a little bit worried. Yeah. Fact is, for many kids, their first exposure to the coronavirus isn't from what's overheard among grown-ups. It's from other kids. What were the kinds of things they were saying? They're just like, um, the coronavirus is going out. Somebody ate a bat. <laughs> Someone ate a bat? Yeah, because of a snake. The snake ate the bat, and then it just kept going on. It's at this point Kelly no, Farrell so steps all the time, in. They'll hear something on the news, and they'll come to school the next day and say, you know, I heard that we're all going to die. We're all going to get a virus. And we're and like, where did, where did you hear that? Let's talk about that. Sebastian, can you come She's here? the director at this school, and lately she's been doing a lot of talking, but also listening. I think kids feel what we portray to them. And so they knew that people were getting worked up about it. People were getting, were talking about it a lot. And so they were worried because they felt the worry of other people. But they didn't know why they had to be worried. I wonder, I mean, th these are young kids. Yeah. Does it, is there a, is there a part of this where it feels like they're almost too young to, to learn about the coronavirus? I don't think so. I think we have to give them the information at a level that's accessible to them. They have a lot of trouble differentiating between uh, what is a rumor and what is fact. And the more we talk about it and the more we teach them how to differentiate that, the better they become at it. And there's more to this than just helping kids feel better. Consider what 13-year-old Daniela told me about one of her friends who's Chinese. He was getting bullied and everybody was saying like that he shouldn't be here, he should go, and everybody was like not going near him or talking to him. So he was like really lonely. And like I stood up for him with all the people and like told them that it's not all Chinese people that have the coronavirus. Hmm. And how did you know that? I kind of like researched because I, I don't know, I get pretty worried about that stuff, but when I know more about it, I don't get as worried. And so why do you think some of the other kids were acting the way they were acting? Either being afraid or bullying other kids because they think maybe they have the virus? I think because they just don't know about like what's happening and they're just, I don't know, they might be trying to like act cool like they know about it or like make conversation, I guess. And they're just scared maybe. Call it the wisdom of a 13 year old but one who clearly feels best prepared for the world when grown-ups loop her in. They're going to hear about it anyway, so I think we need to all recognize that they hear a lot more than we think they do. So if they have a question, answer it. Does it help when you guys talk about it? Yeah. Like, why does it help? How does it help? Um, because you, when you talk about it, you get, uh, you know what's happening about the whole thing. And what would you want to tell grown-ups about how they should be talking to kids like you? I feel like they should just like be straight up because kids, kids can take a lot. They're not weak in the sense that parents think that we are and that you we can should, handle it. Yeah, we can handle it. So. And the funny thing is, the more weight these kids are allowed to carry on their shoulders, the more they seem to feel free to just be a kid. Now, talking to kids about the coronavirus is one thing, but parents also have lots of medical questions about kids, too. Dr. Lennox Huang, chief medical officer at Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children, has some answers. 
My name is Lennox Wong. I'm the Chief Medical Officer and a Pediatrician at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. The thing that worries me the most about coronavirus in children is the amount of misinformation that's out there. I'm going to try and answer some of the more common questions that I hear about coronavirus infections in children. So are kids more susceptible to the coronavirus than adults? Well, we really don't know. What we do know is that there are almost no documented cases of children having coronavirus infections. So I've had some people ask me, how dangerous is the coronavirus compared to the flu in kids? And I have to tell you that the flu is far more dangerous. Every year, thousands of Canadians die from the flu. Right now, we have five Canadians affected with coronavirus, and none of them are children. So what might be the defense against the coronavirus or other respiratory viruses? One of the things that I start teaching children at a very early age is how to wash their hands. And it's something simple you can do at home. You can even sing a song, like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, as a child washes their hands. Also important to teach children to cover their mouths and noses when they sneeze or cough. These are basic, simple um, hand hygiene and respiratory preventative measures that can help prevent the spread of things like coronavirus or other uh, infections. Do children need to wear a mask to school? Well, masks are really great at keeping viruses in, but not so great at keeping viruses out. But wearing a mask is not going to keep your child from getting a cold or the coronavirus, and it's not part of our recommended measures to prevent spread of viral infections. So how should you talk to your child about coronavirus? Well, there's a few things to remember. The first is that your children have already heard about it. They're already talking about it. And I think it's important to balance being honest and clear with being a point of reassurance for your child. Kids can read the feelings of their parents. They know when a parent is anxious. And the fact is, the risk of coronavirus for Canadians remains low. Another thing to consider is that children may be asking questions about where it comes from, who's affected, what do they look like? I think it's important to tell your child that just because an infection may have started in China, it's not an excuse to stigmatize anybody at school. Let's go to Dan Burt right now, who's standing by in our Vancouver newsroom. Dan, you've got some breaking news. Andrew, we're hearing from more Canadians tonight trapped on that cruise ship in Japan. We spoke with one of them a short time ago. She says it's a frustrating wait. We are very worried. You know, if we continue to we quarantine like this, um, we will all eventually get it. I think we have to come on our own the new system now. Jennifer Lee from Vancouver and her husband Benson are among hundreds of Canadians and thousands of other passengers all but stuck in their rooms on the Diamond Princess. She says they were first alerted to the coronavirus on Monday and she expected the captain to tell people who might be feeling unwell to stay in their rooms, but she says that didn't happen. Not until Japanese health officials came on board, tested all the passengers and requested they be confined. Lee says she and other Canadians have started a WeChat group to keep in touch on board, and they are allowed out on their balcony, as you can see, but she would like the federal government to come and get them. Even though we are very healthy now, and we felt that we should leave the boat as soon as possible, even though even if you are sent back to Vancouver or Canada for quarantine, it's better off than stuck in here. Now, there's no indication Ottawa is preparing to do that, at least right now. Lee says they are getting fed and they don't need any medication themselves, but they at least want to be able to take a walk on the deck. Andrew. Okay, coming up. The tiny bug putting the lives of Canadian giants at risk. Mm. We tag along with scientists as they track moose and why this mom is calling her baby girl a warrior. Welcome back. Some other stories we're following tonight. At least 38 people are dead after a pair of avalanches in eastern Turkey. The first slide killed five people and rescuers were searching for two others when a second avalanche hit today. According to officials, most of those buried were rescue workers. There is a new search underway, but it's snowy and the winds are strong. It's not clear exactly how many people are trapped. Legendary actor, producer and director Kirk Douglas has died. I'm Spartacus! I'm Spartacus! 
The Hollywood icon starred in dozens of films and classic roles like Spartacus and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. His son, actor Michael Douglas, made the announcement on Instagram saying Kirk's life was well lived and he leaves behind a legacy in film that will endure for generations. Kirk Douglas was 103. Well, some of Canada's largest animals are facing a potentially deadly problem from the tiniest of parasites. Ticks are literally sucking the life out of them. And they're doing it in increasingly large numbers as the climate changes. But as Kayla Hounsel shows us, a team of Canadian scientists have a way to help. I know. They swoop in like a pit crew, a team of scientists working quickly and efficiently to get what they need from the moose, all in an effort to help the species. The researchers from the universities of New Brunswick and Laval are determined to make sure moose aren't wiped out by these tiny blood-sucking parasites, winter ticks. They're an external parasite, they eat on their blood, and they will stay there all uh, for the old winter, fall and winter on the moose. They're conducting a five-year project to study how ticks survive in the differing climates of New Brunswick and Quebec, and how that affects moose, as they scout for the animals, we're following behind in a chase chopper. Oh my, look at the tracks. Everywhere. Moose populations in both provinces are currently healthy and growing. Oh, there's two right below us, right to the right. A wildlife biologist uses a net gun to capture them. And the net gun techniques is very efficient, very safe for the animals. A vet is on hand to keep the animal comfortable. It's not really anesthetized, just sedation. She won't. We want her to be calm. It allows the researchers to conduct their work. Okay, well, I'll start with the tick counter. Okay. This process gives them an idea of how many okay. ticks are on the entire animal, literally sucking the life out of them. There's uh, an inflammation of the skin, uh, they lose some of uh, their, their fur, uh, and then they change their behavior. There's less time, they, 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 uh, they use more of their, their time to groom, less of their time to eat. In nearby New Hampshire and Maine, scientists have found up to 70% of moose calves have died during the winter. Up to 80,000 ticks have been found on a single moose. 80,000 on just one moose. Now, these scientists are worried climate change could be moving the same problem further north. The global warming is, uh, is likely increasing their abundance. In, in the, uh, the northern limit is moving north and north and north. Warmer winters and less snow cover make it easier for ticks to survive. The scientists weigh the animal, tag it, take a fur sample. They come out pretty easy, hey? They, uh, I'm easy. at the place where the tick eats. And give it a collar. Our GPS collars, we can control them remotely so we can get a location once every hour or once every several hours. The collars also monitor their activity. That will allow them to determine whether moose carrying a lot of ticks move differently or select different habitats. I think it's on us to try to learn and understand all these impacts. So J.D. Irving that. Forestry is also a partner. Because we're planting a tree today and we're going to harvest it in 40 years' time, the climate's going to be completely different in 40 years than it is today. So we really have to get a handle on how is the climate changing, uh, how are wildlife changing, how, are, how, is, how is the habitat changing, so that we can adapt our management. With the work on this moose complete, the vet administers a reversal injection. And within just three minutes, the moose wakes up, takes a little look around, and goes on her way. And the scientists are off to analyze the data to help understand how these emblematic Canadian mascots might be impacted by a warming planet. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, near Tracy, New Brunswick. And next on The National, her baby was coming quickly. She wasn't at the hospital yet, and then this mom's labor was over before she knew it. Her big moment is ours too. Next. Well, this little girl here, only a day old, has already lived quite a life. Her mother expected to give birth in a hospital. Instead, she had her in the back of an ambulance. It was just her and a paramedic underneath Saskatoon's University Bridge. The birth over in less than a minute. And it is our moment. It was less than four minutes into our drive to the hospital out of an eight minute drive. And she all of a sudden said, I have to push. 
About 30 seconds later, when I was getting stuff ready, she said, I have to push again. I checked her. I said, oh my gosh, I see hair. And before my partner could even pull over, I said, I have a baby. He's like, do you need my help in the back? And, and then that late, the other ambulance lady was like, uh, no, she's already out. Keep going. <laughs> All I could see was those like flowers that were on, on the bridge, the, the decorations. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just overwhelmed and in shock still. I can't believe she's here. And you know, it's maybe it's a cliche to talk about the miracle of childbirth, but I don't know. Sometimes things just feel a little miraculous. And, and, and I cannot believe for a second that those folks who were involved in that birth feel any different. <laughs> That's The National for this February 5th. Have a good night.